DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Dr. Bunsen serves as the faculty chair of the Catholic Distance University. He is also a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He is the author or co-author of over 45 books, including the Pope Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia of Catholic History, the Encyclopedia of Saints, the Encyclopedia of U.S. Catholic History, and Pope Francis. Dr. Bunsen serves as a senior contributor for EWTN. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Dr. Bunsen. It's great to be with you, Chris, especially uh, to talk about one of the truly towering figures in the history of the Church. Can we call him the Doctor of the Doctors? Well, he's certainly one of the greatest and most important of the Doctors. I mean, we're, we're talking about someone who was really one of the very first of the Doctors. He was ranked with Ambrose Jerome and, of course, uh, Gregory the Great in 1298 uh, by Boniface VIII. When we think of important figures in the life of the church. It's hard to come up with someone with the possible exception of Thomas Aquinas and St. Paul, who has had so great an influence on the history of not just the church, not just wider Christianity, but really of Western civilization. The church honors him as a saint, a father of the church, a doctor of the church, a doctor of grace, and again, looking also at Thomas Aquinas as arguably the greatest theologian in the history of Christianity. We know as well that Protestant reformers, from Luther to Calvin to Reformed evangelicals, even today, try to claim him and try to use their own interpretations of his vast theological writings to justify their teachings. Could we also say that as far as literature is, is writing goes, he's probably one of the all-time greats? Oh, without question. Consider that... What we know of his writings, what has survived or has been mentioned by him and his contemporaries, encompasses poetry, theology, hymns, studies on scripture, books, and in the Confessions, the most famous autobiography of all time. We know from his faithful friend Posidius, uh, who wrote his biography of St. Augustine, the, the Vita Augustini, that at the time of Augustine's death, the complete list of his works included at least a thousand writings numbered by the author. And then Presidius added that with others that cannot be numbered because he did not give them any number. Beyond that, there were 300 letters, 600 homilies that have uh, survived the passage of the centuries. Originally, there were far more, perhaps as many as between 3,000 and 4,000 as a result of 40 years of, of preaching. But what's so interesting is that for all of that, this immense figure remains largely unknown. Uh, in any meaningful sense to much of contemporary culture today. I mean, think about arguably his most famous quote that uh, I saw mentioned just a, a few days ago by a writer who was thinking himself very clever by mocking Catholic teaching on chastity as hypocritical. And of course, what do we hear from time to time about Augustine, his famous dictum, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Obviously, we need to understand Augustine more and to understand as well the context of his life. Yeah, I've seen it said that for, oh gosh, what, would it be almost a thousand years or until at least the publication of the Imitation of Christ, that St. Augustine's Confessions was the most common manual of the spiritual life. Uh, understandably. But we have to get beneath the reputation. In other words, we need to understand Augustine's primary goal in life in order to understand the man. And for that, uh, we need to look at what was really an, an agonizing search for him. His life is poignant, at times heartbreaking, and it was, and that word, agonizing search for the truth. Not his truth, not other truths, not some truth. And I, I remember uh, Pope Benedict XVI had a, a wonderful way of explaining Augustine. And uh, in fact, he gave a talk at the very tomb of Augustine 
and he described him as a man driven by a tireless desire to find the truth, to find out to, uh, what life is, to know how to live, to know man. But he added that precisely because of his passion for the human being, he necessarily sought God, because it is only in the light of God, the greatness of the human being, and the beauty of the adventure of being human can fully appear. So when we look at what Pope Benedict said, that the story of Augustine is powerfully relevant to every one of us today. Because what does he do? He shows the transforming power of God's love and grace. He shows the path of reconciliation. But he also shows not just to live, how to live, but how to live well. Let's talk about his life. This obviously, for the listener, will be it will be necessary to at least have two parts. The story of Augustine, the, the adventure of Augustine, really does break into two parts. There is the, the life of Augustine, his transformation, the famous story of his conversion and the power of God's grace in his life. And then we look at the results of that transformation, his later life and his incredible work as a, a bishop in Africa and then as a doctor of the church. Both of these really are equal parts, but they're sort of built read the, the writings of Augustine around two main works, the Confessions, in which he talks about that journey to faith, the, the, the union of faith and reason in him. And then, in a way, we, we can look at the city of God, in which, as, as we'll see in, in part two, Augustine was able to take everything that he learned and to defend uh, what he had come to know was true in a culture that was increasingly tortured, imploding from within because of the collapse of late imperial civilization, and at dire threat from outside by the barbarian invasions of the era. And he offers the church as the sanctuary, the safe harbor for all. And the overarching point that I think needs to be made is that Augustine's love for Christ shaped his personal commitment. And, and that really, I think, rests at the heart in what we're going to talk about in part two. That we, we see a life patterned on seeking. And from there, he progressed to a life given totally to Christ and thus to a life for others. In effect, what we're seeing is someone who did not have one conversion, but several. And each impelled him forward to a life of perpetual renewal, of perfecting the virtues, of placing himself more fully at the service of Christ. That being converted to Christ means not living for oneself, being at the service of all. He was born in northern Africa. The story of Augustine begins in North Africa, in the city of Tagaste, in what was the Roman province of Numidia. And the city today is called Souk Aras in modern Algeria. And even then, it was noted as sort of a center of learning in Roman colonial culture. We know that he was born in November of 354 to a very respected local Roman African leader by the name of Patricius a man who actually later became a catechumen under the influence of another one of the great figures of the era, his wife, Patricius's wife, and of course, one of the great mothers in the history of the church, St. Monica, mm. who was a fervent Christian. Now, we know that the family was almost certainly of Roman, Berber, African, and Phoenician descent. Now, despite that rather exotic-sounding origin, they were thoroughly Roman, African, and outlook. And despite the presence of a variety of cultures in North Africa, which then was a crossroads for caravans of spices and silks and slaves from Egypt and deeper Africa, the family spoke Latin. Now, as I said, we, we can't consider Augustine without speaking of his mother, St. Monica, who's a model for all parents struggling to keep their children in the faith. And she tried to exercise an influence on her son and raised him in the Christian faith. We know that he had a brother, the name Navigius, and a sister, whose name unfortunately is not known to us, but who subsequently, after being widowed, became the head of a monastery for women, or a community for women. Long delayed, as sometimes was the custom, his baptism, but he was constantly avoiding it, in part because I think he understood what it would mean to him to be baptized. But he talks about the faith. He says that from my earliest childhood, I was nourished on the name of my Savior, kept it, he said, in the recesses of his heart. Even in his darkest years, he was not carried fully away, as he says, 
But he still underwent a long series of moral and intellectual crises. And his father, who had aspirations for his son as an orator, an expert in rhetoric, planned to send him to Carthage, which was the capital of Roman Africa, and the center of learning for the region. Now consider that what he had on his hands. He had already mastered grammar in local towns. He studied rhetoric in Carthage. He had mastered Latin, but was not quite as successful with Greek and did not learn what was the Punic language, which was spoken by his fellow Roman Africans. Mm -hmm. But he showed probably the greatest promise of any Roman African to come out of what was the Roman African intellectual tradition. Besides all of this training and education, also had a lifestyle that was very challenging, to say the least, as far as his embrace of a lot of immoral behavior. And in particular, there was a relationship with a young girl resulting from that. For both of them, at a rather young age, they would have a son. Well, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, his time in Carthage was a spiritual catastrophe for him. He had unbelievable intellectual gifts, but he was also spiritually immature, emotionally immature, and he was overwhelmed by the lures of the city. His prayer life suffered, and he wrote of praying, but with little expectation of being heard. He succumbed to the parties, the theater, the sexual temptations, uh, and his good looks, his talents as a speaker, and his tendency to excel in almost everything he tried led him more and more to evil. And his mother's worst fears were realized when he announced to her that he had taken a mistress and had even fathered a child. And it was also in Carthage that he first encountered the, a, a book called the Hortensius, uh, a writing by the famed Roman philosopher Cicero, an event that really began his long and winding road out of the church and then back again. You know, Cicero's text, which is lost to history, awoke in Augustine this, this powerful love for wisdom. He wrote about it many years later that the book changed his feelings. What was happening was that there emerged in Augustine a tension. He was convinced that without Jesus, the truth cannot be said to have been found. And since Jesus' name was never mentioned by Cicero, which would, wouldn't have been possible, considering that Cicero was, was murdered in 43 BC during the, the terrible purge that followed the famous assassination of Julius Caesar the year before, but he turned to scripture, trying to find Christ, and again was disappointed, seemingly, uh, in, in part because of the, the poor trans translations from the Latin that were available at the time. But even worse at the time was what he thought was the content. You know, he read book after book of scripture and found there the same complaint that a lot of people make today, and that is there were terrible wars and sufferings. He did not see a coherent plan at that point. He was missing, too, what he thought were the philosophical insights of, of Cicero. And so he put more stock in a dead Roman philosopher than he did in the truths of Scripture, in part because he did not at that point have the wisdom to grasp salvation history. And there he fell into a trap of his own genius, in that on the one hand, he was seeking God and did not want to live without him, but he also grounded his longing for the truth and the allure of pure rationality. And this brought him into contact with the Manichaeans, a religious sect that firmly believed that there was an eternal struggle between good and evil, between the darkness and the light, and that when darkness intruded upon the light, there occurred an intermingling of the mortal with the divine. And this is a mixture, they believed, of, of the trapped in matter. So that those who became hearers, as they called themselves, hoped to achieve rebirth as the so-called elect, the blessed few who had overcome the need for what they saw as the transmigration of souls. And as was typical for Augustine, uh, drawn to the promise of this supposed philosophical system that was untethered from faith, he might at long last be able to grasp the, the force of pure reason and reason alone. And also typical of Augustine, um, much as he was since he began to commit sin, he became exceedingly good at it. Hmm. 
And once he committed to the Manichaean cause, he was all in. There's a real temptation in this Manichaeism to, would you say, intellectual pride? Oh, yes. Yes, very much so. Uh, in, in part because they, they had convinced themselves that they were the elect, they were superior in almost every sense. And because they were superior, therefore, they had the secrets of the universe. And we, we can only imagine the immense pain to Monica mm. that she was enduring at this point, that Augustine's dalliance with the Manichaeans had caused her. She, at one point, wasn't even sure if she should allow her son into her house or to be at her table as he refused to budge on the issues of his heretical beliefs. And she was worried that his genius, his pride, might be a source of scandal to the Christian community. But here was the moment when she took to heart the advice of a holy bishop who very famously, one of the great lines in the history of the church, he encouraged her to keep praying and to keep talking with her son because, as he put it, the son of so many tears could not perish. And uh, the fortitude and the patience of Monica was vindicated. Uh, it was inevitable that a, a mind like Augustine's would grow disappointed with the Manichaeans. He started finding really serious errors in logic in their teachings. And their feeble responses to the Orthodox Christian apologists who reduce their claims and charges to, to ashes. He was shocked as well by their utter moral depravity. Mm -hmm. Something notably that he saw even in, in his own rather reduced moral state. And then he also was shocked by the fact that he was mentally superior to every other member. <laughs> and and, and a, the breaking point came mm -hmm. when he made increasingly firm demands that he wanted the promise explanations of the secrets of the universe and science, and he was told to wait for Bishop Faustus, the, the greatest of the, the Manichaean leaders who would explain all. Well, of course, the day finally arrived, and Augustine met Faustus. What was the result? Well, his, his last hopes for the Manichaeans were dashed when this Manichaean genius was unmasked before Augustine's withering questioning and exposed as nothing more than a charlatan. And from that point on, Augustine began to distance himself. In all, looking back, he had wasted nine years of his life on the sect and still, though, could not subject himself to what he, I think, in his heart knew he needed to do, but instead embarked on his next great project, which was to go to Rome. There really is a lesson, isn't there, Matthew, on this particular portion of St. Augustine's life. He's in that here is a young man. He's between the ages of what, 19 and 28. This appeal, at least in the beginning, of a mindset that essentially belittled the faith and any authority because you become the authority. This is something that I think we're experiencing in, in a very tremendous way. We may not call it Manichaeism, but it sure does, can we say, smell a lot like Manichaeism. <laughs> I mean, its odor is all over the place, isn't it? Yes, it is. It, it's a false intellectuality. Uh, it, it's a false intellectualism. It's a, a false recourse to supposed reason and science. Uh, at the heart of it is pride. As, as you say, it's a rejection of authority. It's the capacity to delude ourselves into th thinking that we can get by uh, without God, that we can succeed on our own. All of the things that Augustine is going to teach about in later years, he was undergoing. But the other aspect, too, is sin. And, and that's something, of course, that we'll, we'll talk more about. But he he recounts that very famous story, and I think it's uh, an important lesson. He talks about the pear tree that was close to mm. his own vineyard that, that he describes as uh, heavily laden with fruit, uh, which, as he, he very famously wrote, was neither tempting for its color nor for its flavor. And then one night, he said, uh, with, he was out with his friends. He had already cultivated bad habits, and they shook and they robbed the tree. And he carried off an enormous load of pears. Mm. 
He said, not to eat ourselves, but to dump out to the hogs after barely tasting some of them. But he added, doing this, he said, pleased us all the more because it was forbidden. And he, rem- he, he wrote that such was my heart, O oh God, that even then it was like a bottomless pit. And what he realized was that it was foul and he loved it. And he loved my own undoing, he said. I loved my error. Not that, he said, for which I erred, but for the error itself. He described himself as a depraved soul falling away from the security of God to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed but shame itself. And that, I think, is a beautiful way of understanding where he was. Let's talk about that particular moment in which he heard a a young child singing a song. During his time in Milan, from about 383 to 386, he passed through what are really three clear phases. He went from being a Manichaean to becoming a skeptic and finally to accepting the Christian religion. And at the very, very heart of this was Ambrose. And Augustine settled in the habit of listening to Ambrose. Now He's a doctor of the church. He's a father of the church. You and I have talked about him. Augustine loved Ambrose's oratorical skills. And we can also suppose that he was intrigued by the fact that he had met his own intellectual equal. Imagine the shock he had in doing that. He was surrounded as well by minds as sharp as his was, but who loved the faith and defended it with immense skill. The respect he gave to Ambrose, who really answered as many questions with patience and depth, prompted him to start focusing not on how Ambrose was speaking, but on what he was actually saying. He moved inexorably toward a true Christian conversion. And he found himself in the midst of what was an intellectual trans- transformation, but this came faster than his moral one. And here is where, looking at Ambrose as a model for chastity, he was still in the chains of really bad habits. And then he said, of course, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. But, but that was because he was not ready yet. It wasn't, it's, it's quite the reverse from what we think of uh, when, when people make jokes about it. What he was getting at was that it was a lament on his part that he was still in chains. But then the day came. He was in the countryside in an estate near uh, Cassisiacum, just outside of Milan. And he was in the garden of a house. He was reading scripture. And as he wrote in the confessions, he said, I was suddenly asking myself these questions, weeping all the while with the most bitter sorrow in his heart. When all at once, he said, I heard a sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. And, and, and it's a passage from the confessions that's really very much in, ingrained in the mind of anyone who's taken the, the time to read it. He says, whether it was a voice of a girl or a boy, he wasn't sure. But it kept saying the same refrain, take and read, take and read. And he said at this point, he looked up. He was trying to figure out if this was some sort of a game. Uh, but he could not remember ever hearing anything like that. And then he said, he began the tears were, were just flowing. But he, he, he stemmed, he said, the flood of tears. And he stood up and said that this could only be a divine command. And he picked up scripture and read the first passage. And he hurried back to the, the spot where the book was. And, and it was the epistles of Paul. He said he seized it, opened it, and in silence read the first passage in which his eyes fell, and it was from Romans. And the passage read, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desire of the flesh. And he said he realized that he had no wish to read more and no need to do so. In an instant, he said, as he came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into his heart and all of the darkness of doubt was dispelled. And so at the age of 32, he was baptized by Ambrose in the Cathedral of Milan in 387. His mother, his son, Adeodatus, and his friends were all there. And it was for him, he said, tears ran from his, his eyes and happy as he was in those tears. 
And he had discovered that a human being can only find a true peace by accepting the peace offered by the Creator. And of course, there, what is the, the very first line from the Confessions? Chapter 1, line 1. He says, you made us for yourself, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. We need to, unfortunately, come to a close on this particular episode, but not a close on the exploration of St. Augustine's life. This is merely part one. In closing, I, this particular part of his life, the, the beautiful scene of a 56-year-old St. Monica, a 33-year-old St. Augustine, and probably one of the most lovely tellings of a parting that uh, has ever been put to paper in yes. that, the, the death of St. Monica. It's uh, almost impossible to read Augustine's account of the passing of his mother with the, uh, without tears. Mm -hmm. Monica's passing came at a time in Ostia, uh, when they were planning to sail back to Africa, she had witnessed the conversion of her son. But she also recognized that the time had come for her, her own passing. She said, you know, that uh, I no longer find any pleasure in this life. But she added that what more I have to do here and why I'm still here, I do not know. <laughs> her passing, however, from probably from a fever in the port of Ostia uh, in 387 really ended beautifully the first half of Augustine's life. And he wrote, and it's, it's, a, it's a great quote, it was not fitting that her funeral should be conducted with moaning and weeping, for such is normal when death is seen as only misery or as the complete end of existence, but she had not died in misery, and death, he wrote, was not her end. Of the one fact we were certain by reason of her character, of the other by our faith. Monica was gone, but she finished her task of bringing her son to Christ. Augustine was now ready to go forward, so he would give the rest of his life to the church and to Christ. And in part two, we're going to see how Augustine placed his talents at the service of You've both. You've been listening to the, Dr. Bunsen, the Doctors so of the Church. The it's a great privilege to be with you as always, Chris. With Dr. Take care Matthew and God bless. Bunsen. To hear and or to download this episode, to the along with many of the others, church, go the to discerninghearts.com with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. To to download this I'm episode, your host, Chris McGregor. along with many others. Join us next go time to for discerninghearts.com. The doctors of the church. This the has been a production of, of discerninghearts.com. I'm Bunsen. your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for the doctors of the church, the charism of wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.